good morning. Welcome to Dallas Church. Will you stand with us as we begin our service today? Welcome to Dallas Church. My name is Emma Ann, and I just want to say that I'm glad that you're here. If you are new with us, please stop by our Connections booth. We would love to chat with you. And then if you're new online, make sure you drop into the chat feature and let us know that you are here. This week, we are continuing as a church family with our Red Letter Challenge. And Pastor Bed is going to talk about how the act of forgiveness is a crucial part of drawing closer to Jesus. With that, let's pray and begin our gathering this morning. Lord, we just want to thank you that we have the opportunity to gather together and join as we worship you in our lives and with our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to focus and center our minds and our hearts on you today and that this gathering would rejuvenate us for the week that's to come. In your name we pray, amen. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us 
breathings and iron wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place challenges pop up all the time. Some for enjoyment, some for a good cause, others are just plain dangerous. What if you tried a new challenge? One that could transform your life, community, and the world. What if you spent 40 days studying Jesus' words and applying his teachings to everyday life, all focused on five principles, being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going like Christ. So what are you waiting for? Let's join together and take the Red Letter Challenge. As a kid, I did a number of foolish things. Maybe you can relate to that. Sometimes I still do foolish things. I spent most of my formative years, as some of you know, on a farm. So about age 10 through going to college, we, my family operated a farm. My mom and, and my stepfather, and we worked pretty hard. but. When you're a young person, a kid, and you're around heavy machinery that you don't really know how to operate, so it wasn't my fault, okay? There were moments when I didn't quite understand how the tractor controls worked. If you've been around heavy equipment, you realize sometimes the steering wheels are in the back. Totally changes the dynamic of steering. 
There were many moments where I almost took out precious family members because of my lack of tractor skills. Around the farm, there are a lot of things that can hurt you. They're like open drive lines, right? Any loose clothing, you're, you're, you're goner. They had these big things called combines, which have these huge mouths on the front with spikes that are rotating. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't my fault all the time. There were many near misses. There was a moment where, there's actually several moments, my parents would tell you, where I actually fell asleep while actively operating said machinery. Really, really not good. And there was a moment, and some of you know this story, that I literally broke a truck in half. That was my fault. If you want details, I'd be happy to provide all those details for you. It was a dark day in my farming career, which was very short-lived. But one of the things that I really appreciated about that time in my life was the forgiveness and the grace that were offered to me by my parents, but specifically my stepdad, Mike. Some of you know him. The amount of patience that he had when I would create these costly mistakes on the farm over and over again, I still hold those lessons dear to my heart. The, the grace and the forgiveness that he showed me. And I know there was moments where he put on a good face and then like went off to his you know, office and cried profusely over the cost that I just incurred for the family. But I really appreciated that willingness to forgive and teach me and help me move forward. It's really helped me actually in my life because I realize how powerful forgiveness is. And maybe, maybe you've experienced some of that in your life and are so thankful for that. We are continuing in our Red Letter Challenge. And this is a challenge that we kicked off a few weeks ago. In fact, some of us have the workbook here. If you've been following along, this is day number eight. In fact, today's devotion is great. It talks about using worship music to kind of spur us close to Jesus. I love worship music. Uh, so that's day eight. If you're, even if you didn't have a workbook, what we're trying to do is, is not break the chain, right? Get out a calendar. Try to spend at least a few minutes reading Jesus' words, which are printed in red ink in most New Testament parts of the Bible. So we've encouraged you to do that. Yes, all the words are important, but especially those words in red, cue us and focus in on the words that, that Jesus said, and they can, they can transform our life. So last weekend we talked about the importance of being with Jesus, that we spend time with him. That involves certainly scripture reading, but also time in prayer, maybe time singing some great old hymns, which I love to do, or even modern hymns that we're singing today. Spending time with Jesus, that's where it all started. We're being in relationship with him. And then while we're with him, we'll notice that there's a priority that he seemed to have in his life, which was being forgiving. And so that's what our theme is today. We're going to talk all about forgiving. And, and this whole idea of the Red Letter Challenge, it's not a gimmick. It's not some kind of a, a quick fix. What this is, is what if we were able to spend time not only reading the words of Jesus, but putting them into practice? And how would that change our families, our marriages, our community? What if we as a church family could put Jesus' words into practice so much that people would stop rejecting Jesus because of Christians? that they would be drawn to him just like they were in the first century because of his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his love, his gentleness. That's what drew us to Jesus anyway. What if we could as a church family, as we put his words into practice, change the narrative that those outside the church would see in us and want to be part of it? And that's our hope with this challenge, not just to grow, but also to, to help people be part of his church. And we've, we've been talking about the five priorities or principles of Jesus. As you're reading the red letters, you'll notice there's some priorities of Jesus. They include being with him. We talked about that last week. Today we're talking about forgiving. He also talked about serving and giving and going. So those are the five principles that we're going after in this series. And today we're talking about forgiveness because as he forgives us, we just can't help but extend that forgiveness to others. And so that's what we're aiming for today. Hi, I'm Pastor Ben. I'm glad you're here today. Whether you're with us in person or you're online, so glad. We are one church worshiping Jesus. We do this every Sunday. It's a time to hit the reset button. It's the first day of the week. Take a deep breath with me, wherever you're at. Right? We know from science that's a good thing to do every once in a while not just when you're frustrated with somebody next to you. So you take a deep breath, you let it out and reset. Today's the first day of the week. Why do we celebrate this gathering on the first day of the week? Because this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, 
He was born in a miraculous way about 2,000 years ago, lived a perfect life, went to the cross for all of our sin, past, present, and future, but then on the third day, on a Sunday, rose from the dead, revealed himself to the world, and changed human history forever. That's why we gather. That's why we worship on Sunday. So I'm so glad you've made it a point to be with us today. Now let's pause for a word of prayer and ask God to speak to our hearts about the idea of forgiveness. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your love, your faithfulness, your mercies that are new every morning. Father, we're so thankful that you offer forgiveness through your son, Jesus. And and that forgiveness is not only something that changes our life, but it it, it can change other people in our world's life too. So Father, help us to be ones who are forgiven, but also who extend forgiveness. And may you speak by the power of your Holy Spirit to each of our hearts today as we listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, how much do you feel like you have it all together? If you look around this room, many of us, we've showered, we've shaved, Thank you for showering. You online, we don't know, but we're just hoping as you're in your pajamas. <laughs> but we, we put on a good face sometimes, don't we? We put on a good face, we smile. What do we often say when someone says, well, how are you doing? We say, yeah, I'm fine. When sometimes we're barely holding it together. Some of you had weeks like that. Some of you are feeling that right now. You're barely holding it together. Sometimes we put on a face, but it's not true to what we know is going on deep inside. We struggle with uh, our our hearts sometimes. We struggle with sin. You know, we talk about in in, in the Christ, as Christ followers and as, as Christians, we talk about Jesus forgiving our sin on the cross. Now, he paid for our sin. Once we say yes to Jesus, we are in. We're part of his family. But the scriptures also tell us about this process of living up to the calling he, that we've received from him. And that means that we're sanctified, but there's also a process of sanctification that, that we begin to, to deal with sin by the power of the Holy Spirit now living in us. We no longer have to say yes to sin. We're actually freed from that slavery. And that means that we begin walking in step with the Spirit more and more every day. That means that, that our hope is that the sin that we're kind of dealing with right now, five years from now, we would have moved forward and matured. Now, there may be other things that the Lord brings to us, and that's the process of sanctification. But the reality is we are all sinners. We're saved by grace, but we are all sinners. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I've heard one preacher say, actually a few preachers say, you know what the Greek word for all means? All. Yeah, here you go. Now you're a Greek expert. Yeah, Didn't see that coming. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's who we are, and we are works in progress. But we can't forget the fact that we have issues, and we're going to work on some issues this year, and then maybe next year we got some more. He's constantly honing and perfecting us, and that's a beautiful thing. We're, we're, we're being honed and perfected until that one day we cross over into new heavens and new earth, and you know what? We're not going to miss a beat. Because we've already been learning how to be more patient, more kind, more loving. And so when we get in the kingdom, we're going to act like that. So he's, he's honing and perfecting us. But we have to realize, like we don't understand how powerful the grace of Jesus is, the, the power of his forgiveness, until we realize the reality is we're sinners. There's a moment in the movie Toy Story. Some of you have seen Toy Story. You like Toy Story. It came out in the mid-90s, kind of a game changer with regard to animated films. There's a moment where Woody, I think he's played by Tom Hanks. Woody is this car- cowboy character, and, and he talks to Buzz Lightyear. Buzz Lightyear is like this spaceman, and I think he's played by Tim Allen or something. And so they're having this conversation, and Buzz Lightyear is not realizing who he is. And at one point, Woody grabs him. Do you remember this scene? And he says, you are a toy. I think he does that whole thing with his voice. You're welcome. Now you'll take that. You are a toy. The idea is, it's not a self-esteem thing, people. It's just that we got to realize we, we are sinners, and we need, his, we need the grace of Jesus every single day. We are sinners saved by grace. We have to realize who we are so that we can get worked on by Jesus. We understand that we are works in progress. And so that should always humble us, not shame us. That should humble us to realize there are other people that we'll meet that are early on in their journey. They're just early on. So we need to have grace with them. You know, some of us have had a tough time knowing exactly how to respond to this whole pandemic thing. And uh, the church has kind of struggled to know, what do we do? What's, what's, what's the, right, what the right call? Some of us have reacted in ways others of us haven't. But the deal is, we need to have extra grace for each other. Because none of us have gone through this. 
right? Extra grace required, E-G-R. Some of you look around this room and you go, that's an extra grace required person right there. <laughs> extra grace, I don't know, you might be looking at me. We need the forgiveness every day and so that we can extend that to other people. The good news is that we have a great Savior. We have great sin, but we have a great Savior in Jesus. And He can help us move past our past. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can actually move past our past. We don't have to be defined by what we screwed up on before. We can, we can get past our past, and that's our hope. There's a story about forgiveness that if you've, if, you've, if you've read the scriptures, if you've read the, the New Testament documents, if you've read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this to me is the standout story of forgiveness. And it, it, it involves a guy named Peter and some charcoal. A guy named Peter and some charcoal. You're like, is charcoal actually mentioned in scripture? Yes, it is. It's mentioned only twice in the Bible. And it has to do with the beginning of Peter's story and sort of the redemption part of Peter's story. So if you have a Bible or a device, I encourage you to find John 18. And let me just set it up for a second, because this is the first charcoal appearance, right? This is charcoal appearance number one, John 18. And, and let me just give you some backdrop here. Jesus is finishing his ministry. He's kind of ending those three years with his buddies and his friends and his early followers. That included women. So we have those early followers. He's wrapping it up. And he's trying to give them some final words, some, some, some things to, to keep, keep in mind, some things to be aware of. And one of the things that he tells his disciples is there's going to be some dark days ahead. In fact, some, some really crazy things are going to happen, guys. And he's like, what's going to happen at some point is we're actually, I'm going to, I'm going to be killed by the Gentiles. He basically saying, I'm going to be killed by the Romans, but I'm going to, I'm going to raise to life on the third day. Now, his disciples heard these things, but they, I don't think they were really aware of all that was going on. You're, you're, you're going to have some rough days ahead. And at some point, Jesus basically gives them the impression that they might be tempted to fall away. Like, you guys are going to have a tough time, and be careful, and you're going to be scattered. And, and at one point, Peter, my favorite guy in Scripture, he's the, always the first one to open his mouth. And what does Peter do while they're all sitting around, Jesus is talking about, oh, some of you might fall away. Peter can't stand himself. He stands up and he's like, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna betray you, Jesus. I am not like these Yahoos in this room. I am better than these dudes. I'm better than that guy, James. I'm better than these old fishermen. I will never betray you. That's what he says. Way to go, Peter. Foot in mouth moment. So he says that around Matthew 26. And by the way, all four Gospels, check this out, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all pick up the story. And I'm wondering if later Peter's like, did you all have to cover this story? Couldn't one of you just have left it out? Because it's kind of a dark moment for Peter. He has several in the scriptures, but this is a particularly dark one because he says, I will never betray you. And, and that's you know, Matthew 26, around, somewhere around there. And then we get the detail in all four Gospels that Within a short amount of time, guess what Peter does? He does exactly what he says he's not going to do. And then that shows up in, in John chapter 8. And so what happens is, here's where the charcoal comes in. You're like, why do we still have charcoal up on the screen? So the trial of Jesus happens. It's under the cover of night, which trials should never have happened by that means. So we already know this is a bogus trial. But Jesus' disciples, most of them scatter because they're worried about their life, right? They're worried that they're next. So there's only a couple of disciples that are kind of watching what's happening with this trial. And one of them is John. And John may have had some special relationships with maybe some of the, the priestly lines. So John may have been closer into what the action was going on. But Peter, he didn't have any of those connections. But he still wanted to know what was going on with this trial. So you see him kind of in the background, kind of watching what's happening. You see Jesus sometimes in front of different, you know, legal experts. And, and, and so Peter is on the fringe. And he's warming himself around, I like to think of it as a big barrel. Probably wasn't a barrel. Probably didn't have those back then. But I, as a kid on the farm, when we burned garbage, we burned it in the burn barrel. So I like to think of it as a barrel. So for, for today's sake, let's just say it was a big 50-gallon barrel, and they got fire in there. And guess what the fire is fueled by? You got it, charcoal. You guys are quick today. 
I've only had it up on screen for five minutes. <laughs> so he, they're warming, he's warming his hand around some charcoal. And as you know the story, some different people come up to him. They notice he's kind of got a little Galilean accent, accent or something. I'm not even sure. They notice maybe he's dressing kind of like a Galilean. He dresses like a hick. I don't even know how they know Peter was with Jesus. But they say, hey, weren't you with Jesus? This happens three different times. And what does Peter say every moment he gets? I don't know him. At some point, one of the four Gospels, it might have been John, says that at, at the last one, Peter is like cussing to himself about it. So he's just adamant, right? That, you know, when, when, when someone uses a cuss word, that's like pretty, you're like, ooh. That just brings up a notch or something. And so he's, he's adamant that he is not one of the, the followers of Jesus. I don't know how this happens. I think it's in John 18, if you're still there in your Bible. At some point on that third, I don't know Jesus statement, he catches Jesus' eye. And Jesus looks right at him. Now Jesus knows what he just did. Peter knows what he just did. And I don't know about you, but I don't see a look of anger on Jesus' face. Do you? Do you see a look of anger on Jesus' face in that moment? He looks at Peter. He spent three years with Peter. He looks at him, and he might have been doing this. Here's Peter again. But I don't, see, I don't see Jesus being angry. I see him with the look of love. He looks across there, and you know what the scriptures say that Peter did? He was cut to the heart. And he goes away, and he weeps. Now, it's not a pretty thing, y'all, when a grown man weeps. I'm a man of a certain age now, and I've realized that sometimes I cry. You know, I'm guessing that Peter's cry was an ugly cry. I'm thinking snot coming out. I don't know, okay? I don't know. But he's upset. He's a grown man. He's upset. And, he, and Jesus caught him right there, but loved him. Now, what do we do? Well, time passes. We know that Jesus, the trial was a bogus trial. It ended in his murder, or his, his capital punishment. He, raises, he ri rises from the dead on Sunday. We already talked about that, right? And on the first day of the week, guess who were the first people to report Jesus' resurrection? Men or women? Women. Huge deal in the first century. Women are the whole reason we're even in this room right now. Because they saw the risen Jesus. That's powerful. Now, anybody would have known back in the day, if you're going to win a court case, it better be a man giving you the, the witness. And who was the first at the, the tomb? Women. They come back and give the announcement. The disciples hear that announcement. They don't even really, really believe the women. And then Jesus makes some appearances. And we have some passage of time. We don't know how long of time it goes from John 18 to John 21. But something powerful happens in John 21 that tells us that Jesus is not done with you. Peter followed Jesus for three years. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time. And some of you still struggle with sin. Jesus is not done with you. In John 21, we don't know how much time. But Peter is with the other disciples. We don't know how many of them. Now they're hanging out in a place. Or maybe, maybe they're at the, the beach house. I don't know where they're hanging out. And Peter is bored. <laughs> That's the way I read it. It's not scripture. It doesn't say that. I think he's bored. And he's like, hey, guys, I want to go fishing. Can we go fishing? And, you know, many of them, if you remember, some of the first disciples, what was their main day job? Fishing. And so they're like, we'll go with you. So, so they all decide to go on this fishing trip. And they're fishing, and it looks like they're fishing at night. I don't know why they fish at night. I, I fished on the ocean in the day. I would never want to fish at night because I'm afraid of the ocean. Truth be told, it scares me a little bit. You've got to respect the ocean. They're probably on a lake. I get it. But they're fishing, and then guess what happens? So daylight shows up, and how much fish are we talking Isn't it weird how every time we see the disciples fishing, especially when Peter's at the helm, how much fish, how good of a fisherman was Peter? He seems to never have any fish. Some of you have fished, and you know how that feels. You feel like instead of fishing all day, you were casting. That's what you were doing all day. So apparently they were casting all night, and they found nothing. They see somebody on the shore. Now we know it's Jesus, okay? Spoiler alert. But they see someone on shore. There's a fire going. Hold on to that. There's a fire going. Whoever this person's cooking something. And uh, he calls from the shore. Hey, have you guys caught any fish? 
And of course the answer is no. no. So <laughs> Jesus being the fishing genius that he is, he says, well, the problem is you're fishing on the wrong side of the boat. So what does he tell them? Yeah. Well, on the other side. And of course, what happens? You know this. Bunch of fish. So much so that they counted. Does anybody see that in John 18? How many, how many fish were there? Over 150. 150. Come on, give me the real number. Numbers matter. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. 153 fish. I think that must have been pretty exciting for him. Now, what does Peter realize right away? Who's on the shore? Because haven't they been through this before? Haven't they been through this exact scenario where they catch nothing all night, Jesus tells them to toss, <laughs> toss the nets on the other side, and all of a sudden they can't hold the amount of fish. Well, they get a count of 153. They get to the shore. Peter, he realizes who Jesus is right away. He jumps out of the boat, closing everything. He tosses the life jacket. He don't care. He's, he's swimming for the shore. He knows it's Jesus. When he gets on to the shore, he sees that Jesus already has fish cooking. And he's got some bread, which is, par I miss bread. I've been on this fast for a while, no bread. I tell you, I miss bread. Jesus has got some bread. I didn't know that he cooked bread. I didn't know he knew how to make bread. But he's got bread, and he's got fish, and guess what kind of fire is on the shore? What's fueling the fire? Come on. This is like minute number seven now. Charcoal. The charcoal fire. Now, why do you think that matters? Come on. It's a reminder, right? Well, so what happens? So they have some food. As the, as the breakfast is concluded, let's pick up the story. John 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, he said to him tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Why? Because he said it to him a third time. Third time, he said, look, Lord, you know everything. <laughs> you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times over a charcoal fire. Do you see a correlation? Probably saw it like 10 minutes ago. But I'm slow. 10, 10 times we get this idea of Jesus restoring Peter. And this is probably my favorite. Three times he denied Jesus and then he gets a chance to be restored and forgiven, and reconciled to Jesus. And what happens to Peter? Is that the end of Peter's story? What happens? He begins to lead the Jesus movement in the first century. The early church kicks off by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter, of all of the twelve disciples, it's Peter who begins to lead a movement of the Jesus people. And within a couple of centuries, the entire Roman Empire is changed. So much so that within three centuries, it hits Rome. And Constantine, who is the emperor, Christianity touches him. Peter was restored and led a movement that you could argue easily changed human history and Western culture forever. That's quite a story of redemption, isn't it? Yay, Peter. I, I can't wait to ask him, how did that feel? <laughs> to, 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 to have this happen, then all your buddies record it. He said, well, I want to make sure they all recorded that one. The John 21 moment. The charcoal moment. He goes on to lead. Look, Jesus, what's the point here? Jesus can use your missteps, your mistakes for good. He really can. He can use those moments, those moments even that we're not proud of. He can step into those moments. He can bring light into dark places. And look, he can use your difficulty to help other people. He can turn your mess 
into a message. He can turn your mess into a message. He can turn your test and your trial into a testimony. And He can use your weakness as a witness. Some of you have gone through that a little bit. You've seen Jesus use your story to empower and heal other people. Jesus wasn't done with Peter, and He's not done with you or me. And He's not done with the people that we see around us that are struggling. He is not done with those people that voted different than you, around you. He is not done with those people who look different than you. He is not done with them either. And He's put you in a unique position to extend forgiveness, just like you've received to them too. God can use your setback as a setup for a comeback. I really believe that He can if we let Him do that work in us. Jesus is stronger than our greatest failure. 1 John 2, 1 says this, My dear children, I write this to you so that you won't sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. We have an advocate with the Father. We are forgiven to forgive. It's powerful. You see, I think as we experience that forgiveness in our life, those charcoal moments... I don't know what those charcoal moments are for you right now or in the past. But we bring Jesus into those charcoal moments and He can turn those moments into healing for other people and for ourselves. And here's my only point today. You and I, we live forgiven to forgive. We live forgiven to forgive. I find it so interesting that it's Peter also in the Gospels that confronts Jesus one time about how many times we're supposed to forgive people. Isn't it ironic that it's Peter that has the discussion with Jesus? One time he walks up to Jesus and he says to Jesus, hey, Lord, and this is Matthew 18, by the way, if you want to check me on it. But Matthew 18, he talks to Jesus and says, hey, how often ought we ought to forgive people? And I think you get the sense that, that Peter's kind of walking with a swagger. Like he's going to choose a number real high. And uh, he says, hey, Jesus, how many times should we forgive someone? Like seven times, thinking that's pretty high. Do you know what Jesus responds to him with? He multiplies it. Some scriptures say either 77, depending on your translation, or 70 times seven. What does that mean? As much as it takes, Peter. As much as I've forgiven you, basically, you need to forgive other people. We live forgiven to forgive. Let Christ into your charcoal moments. Look, I realize that in this Christian walk, we are all walking with the limp. We are all walking with the limp. We've had sin issues. We have struggles that God is working on. We're works in progress. We are people who walk with the limp, but we have a great Savior that we can introduce people to. I heard one theologian one time say, it's like like we've been given the cure to sin, And then we can extend that cure to other people, but we still have struggle. It's like we've got the sin issue that we're also allowing the Holy Spirit to work on us, daily sanctification, being more like Jesus, but we can extend that forgiveness to other people. It's a beautiful thing. We live forgiven to forgive. And here's what I want to do for a moment. Because we don't often do this. I want to take a moment of a prayer, and I want to walk through 10 questions with you And I don't want you to look around the room, whether you're online with us or here in person. We're one church. I want you to take some time and do some business with the Lord. I'm I'm gonna talk about some things that may be hard to talk about, but I want you to close your eyes, bow your heads, and I want you to answer these questions with honesty. Because sometimes we put on our game face, we put on a real nice image, but we're broken and we need help. And here's the deal. If you ever thought you were alone, struggling, you're not. I want you to take a few moments. I want everybody to do this. If you can, bow your head, close your eyes, and I want you to answer these questions with you and the Lord in your heart. Here's the first one. Have you ever struggled with depression, with fear, or anxiety? Do you have anything in your life that you regret? Is there anything in your life right now that you are constantly ashamed of? Have you ever been abused or have you ever hurt someone? Have you ever considered taking your own life? And if you have, we're so thankful that you're here with us today. Have you ever intentionally harmed yourself? 
Have you ever been intimate or had an inappropriate sexual relationship with someone you're not married to? Is there anything in your life that you've not been able to quit doing? Have you ever self-medicated? Do you struggle with attractions and temptations and thoughts that you know are outside the will of God for your life? And Lord, as we've answered those questions before you right now, we pray as a church family together as one. And we recognize our sinfulness, but also your great grace. Father, I pray that your light and your Holy Spirit would move into each of us in these different areas that we all answer differently. Father, we all have brokenness, we all have sin, and we all have struggle. And Father, right now, we boldly ask you to invade those areas right now. Father, would you invade all of those areas that were broken and need healing? Those dark places that we've not allowed your light to get into. And I pray that, Father, today would begin healing. Father, do your mighty work by the power of your Holy Spirit to restore us, to forgive us, so that we can forgive others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You see, some of you probably answered some hard answers there between you and the Lord. And you may need to bring someone in on that. You know, if it's something, it's a, it's a constant struggle. You need to bring a friend in and say, hey, would you pray with me? Would you help me? Can I confess this sin to you? Sometimes when we own it out loud, There's healing in there. But if you thought you were alone with sin, if you thought you were alone with struggle, you're not. If you thought that the church is full of perfect people, it's not. If you thought that no one understands, they do. We do. We are sinners, but saved by a powerful, graceful God. And we have been forgiven so much. We are sinners, but we have a great Savior. We are to live forgiven so that we can be forgivers. Before we can do anything for Jesus, we are with Jesus. That's what we learned last week. And as we're with Jesus, we realize that a big part of not only following Him, but being His hands and feet in the world is extending forgiveness. And what a wonderful thing that could be if we were known as a church, a body of people, a body of believers that were forgiving people that we were extending forgiveness. I mean, Jesus even taught us a prayer that included this very thing. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6? Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed or praised be your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. It's right there. What if we could be a people who are forgiving? Imagine a church known as people who extend forgiveness. In a time like we're in right now, that's life. We can bring, we can bring life to people right now struggling with this. I want to pray for us all in a minute, but if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never said, I want him as my Lord and Savior, I want that forgiveness in my life, whether you're with us here or online, you can say yes to Jesus. Please help us to take a next step with you. We would love to pray with you on that. If you've never said yes to Jesus, You can be completely forgiven and start a new life today. We would love to celebrate that with you. But for the rest of us who've been maybe following Jesus for a while, would you look at this week and say, how can I be more forgiving? How can I extend forgiveness to the people in my world? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us and your faithfulness that you offer forgiveness and mercy. We don't deserve it. We know it. Lord, I pray that you'd help us all have the courage to bring you into our charcoal moments so that we can not only embrace your forgiveness, but show that to other people. Lord, may we be a people of forgiveness day in and day out. And Father, may your Holy Spirit move in a powerful way as we we extend your love and mercy and grace and, of course, forgiveness to the people around us in our world. And may they see your love through us and be drawn to you. We pray all this all in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we live forgiven? Well, you know what? We can start right now during this time of response. A time of response, a time of communion, is really about communication. And communication is a two-way street where we uh, listen to God and we talk to him. God wants to know that mess, the the trouble, the the struggle that's going on in our lives. He wants to, to hear that. He knows what we've been going through. He's seen it. And he wants us to bring that to him, to this communion table. 
and, and pour out our hearts to him, cry out to him, and let him fill us back up. That's what a, a relationship is about. Uh, that's what Pastor Ben is talking about with this life of, of living forgiven and being able to forgive others. It starts right now as uh, Ryan and, and the band are going to lead us in some songs. We're going to have a chance as we take the bread and the juice and take a time of communion, this time that's set aside uh, just with us and God uh, to pour out our hearts, to confess our sins, to ask God uh, to lead us and guide us as we go into this week. So we're going to invite you to do that. Also, if, if you're a member of Dallas Church, this is our chance to give. You can do that here in our building. We have uh, giving boxes in the back. You can also mail a check to our, our church PO box or uh, give at dallaschurch.org or our church center app. So many ways to do that, and, and we thank, thank you for your faithful giving. Um, but let's pray right now and, and go into this time of, of response and, and communication with God. Lord Jesus, thank you that we are forgiven people. That, Lord, when we mess up, you see us the same way that you saw Peter when he denied you three times. You didn't hold that against him, Lord. You restored him in love. And, God, that's exactly what you want to do with us. Help us, Jesus, to come to your table this morning and confess our sins and to ask you to lead us and fill us up and build us anew. Thank you, God, uh, for the way that you continue to love us and care for us. Lead us into this week. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. May you speak confusion fades just a word and suddenly I'm not afraid cause you speak freedom rings there is in every single word you say Cause I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me And I don't want to miss one word you speak Quiet my heart, I'm listening. Troubles roar, and troubles ring. You whisper peace. When I don't have the words to say, I won't lose hope. When storms will break, you keep your Don't keep me safe And I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is loud to me Cause I don't want to miss one word you speak It's quiet my heart, I'm missing it what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher. You know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. Yeah. 
speak Cause everything you say is not to me Cause I don't want to miss one word you speak It's quiet my heart I'm listening Cause I don't want to miss one word you speak What says that to me? Cause I don't want to miss one word you speak. It's quiet my heart on this
Hey, thanks for being with us today. I'm so glad that you joined us. Just a reminder, if you are new with us, please stop by the Connections booth if you're here in person and chat with David. He has a gift that he'd like to give you. And then if you're new online, just drop into that chat feature and let your host know that you were here. If you are new-ish with us and you've been here for a while, you kind of, you know, you like it here, you like the people, but you're not really sure what it means to call Dallas Church your home church, we have a class for you. On January 31st, we will be hosting a starting point meeting, which will give you all of those details. All of that information is available in the Church Center app, so if you don't have that Church Center app yet, make sure you download that and make Dallas Church your home church, and then you can register for that starting point class, and that, again, is happening on January 31st. So thanks for being with us today. Have a great week.